How's everybody doing this morning? Did you get some coffee? Is it good? What brand are we using back there? Duncan? Sick. Huh? Lavazza. Does anybody like Duncan Donuts coffee? You do? Okay, well, some people like it. I heard that. I'm sorry. Um, does anybody like Lavazza? Lavazza is the other brand that we use. People... Does anybody like Starbucks? Don't raise your hand right now. Lord Jesus, help these people. Anyway, we're trying to get good coffee back there for you. So um, I was talking to Valerie. I was like, come to church on time, right? Not you. You were here early. We were talking about it. I mean, it's Yuma. It's not far. Can't blame it on the traffic. Huh? Oh, yeah. And uh, not just that. uh, Guys, you can come early and have coffee. And talk to your friends. You're like, well, I don't have any friends. Well, that's why. <laughs> Come early and make some friends. Have some coffee. Well, I don't drink coffee. Well, be a grown-up. <laughs> Receive the Holy Spirit and start drinking coffee. Salvation can be yours as well. So uh, anyway, I um, want to greet Mesa Church this morning. Everybody say hey to Mesa. Yeah, give me a hand. We're live with our Mesa Church this morning for the word of the year. 2023 word of the year. Happy New Year, guys. Happy New Year. How many people are excited, looking forward to this year? Yeah, it's awesome. You know, a lot of people, I've been seeing a lot of posts on social media, which I'm kicked off Facebook again, but it's only six days this time. But uh, they usually let me out early for good behavior. Um, But I've been seeing a lot of things, uh, posts on social media lately. People are saying, yeah, I'm not looking forward to this year after last year. I don't hear anybody saying this this is my year. And I thought, what a terrible way to live. I'm not going to live like that. Come on. How many people are expecting great things this year? And how many people are smart enough to know there's going to be some difficult things too? Because that's life, right? But we're expecting some great things this year, amen? And when I say we, I ain't just talking about us. I'm talking about you personally, in your life, in your family, amen? Come on, let's expect great things, and then let's celebrate those great things when they happen. And so, word of the year, 2023. So every year I pray, and I know that's encouraging to you that your pastor prays. Um, Every year I pray and ask the Lord for a word for our church for the year, because I think it's good to have a focus for the year. Something's kind of like a guiding Um, you know, if you focus on 10 things, it's hard to hit those 10 things, right? But I like to have one thing that we really want to grow in. And and last year, the word for the year was double down, to double down in our commitment to Jesus, double down in our marriages, double down with our kids and our jobs and and different areas of our life. And so we doubled down. and, And interesting thing, the Bible says, you know, there were some people that heard the word and then there were those who received it and mixed it with faith. Some people are saying, yeah, we heard double down last year. I, you know, it didn't make a difference to me. Well, yeah, but the, everybody's going to hear it this morning. But there are going to be those who receive it and mix it with faith. Are you listening? Not to what I'm going to tell you, but to what the word of God tells you and promises you. What you want to do is you want to receive it. That's a good thing. But then mix it with faith. And then Pastor Messer from Mount Zion, one of my heroes in the faith, a great missionary. He says this, and I love it. He says, the word works for those who work the word. And so we don't wanna just hear it and say, okay, good enough, but we wanna put it into practice in our life. And so I was praying about the word for 2023 and um, November, I think about it more. December, I pray about it more. And then as the month goes on, I'm like, come on, Jesus, give me something good. And you know, I could come up with something cool. I mean, I can come up with cool things and cool sayings and rhyming things and cool. I'm not trying to do that though. I'm trying to ask the Lord, What's something that will be good for us, for our church? Not, not the church in, at large in the world, not the church at Yuma, all the Christian churches, but us, you know, in Mesa and, and Yuma. What's good for our church, something that we can focus on specifically? And so it was Christmas Eve. We had um, Christmas. We celebrated Christmas with our family on um, Christmas Eve because then they went to the other part of the family's Christmas on Christmas Day. You guys know how you do that, right? How many people have to go to multiple houses? Why can't people just get together? They won't, but, right, you got to go to multiple houses and do all that. So we, do, we did ours on Christmas Eve, so we had dinner and stuff in, in the late afternoon, and then we came to church with our family, and we, we uh, had a great time on our Christmas Eve service, and it was, it was fantastic. We took communion with our family. It's powerful. I want to encourage you. Communion tables are open during, before church, after church, during worship. 
um, go take communion with your family, super powerful. Took communion, we were sitting there with our family, we're opening presents after church, it was a great time. I, I was really sitting there, I'm, I'm getting, see my beard, it's getting, the dark hair is going away. The gray has come, you know what I'm saying? Remember he used to have like a gray stripe and that was cool? That's gone. Um, so I'm sitting there, you know, being 54, looking at my grandkids and my kids and my wife, and we're just thinking, man, this is good. You know, this is good. God is good. And I was thankful. What a great day, you know, for our family. I was enjoying that. And, and my wife gave me a present, and I opened it, and it was golf balls. And uh, I don't know why she gives me golf balls. I never lose them. Like, I've been playing with the same ball for like four years. I can't even play with the same ball for four holes. So unfortunately, I needed that gift at all times. And I opened the package up, and the golf balls were, were gold. <laughs> and I was like, that's cool, gold golf balls. And then I was envisioning this ball off the tee, climbing, a little bit of a draw, hitting the dark green grass and just running down the fairway, and there's my gold ball. The only problem is that I almost always hit it into the rough where the grass is brown. You can't see this. Right, Luke? You can't, Luke was with me. You cannot find it. it. It's gone. So a couple of these I donated to the other golfers behind me because I know they also hit bad shots and they shouldn't be over there looking for their ball. But when they find this, they were receiving the word. They were receiving a blessing for 2023. They were picking it up, glory to God, putting it in their pocket. And the grace of God was going with them. From now on, I'm praying over these things every time I get up on the tee box. I'm like, Lord, if I'm not going to get a birdie, give this to somebody who could. <laughs> you might think that's weird, but in the Old Testament, they were literally praying over handkerchiefs and people were getting healed. I guarantee you some old guy was out there at the golf course. He reached out. He's like, oh, look, here's the ball. He's like, oh, my back. Praise the Lord. I'm going to church. I guarantee, that's my faith. That's where I'm at. You're not going to talk me out of it. Anyway, so got these gold golf balls. <laughs> I don't have that many left. <laughs> I mean, come on, that was like a week ago, right? <laughs> and then um, Levi and Miranda, they gave me a gift and I opened it. And it wasn't the gift, well, I love the gift, but it wasn't the gift that caught my attention. I opened it and it was a shiny gold uh, metal box that the gift was in. And I thought right there, I thought, man, this is going to be a year of gold for me. I was like, that's good right there. I like that. I was like, thank you, Lord. This is going to be a year of gold. See, I forgot all about you, and I was receiving something great. Even though I was literally praying that day, Lord, I need a word for our church, I forgot all about you. And I was like, man, this is a golden year for me. Let's go, Jesus. And I was thinking, I'm getting paid. Come on, somebody. You know, I don't know if I was going to win the lottery or what. Um, yeah, that's not what Jesus was talking about. But I would like to win the lottery, Jesus. That's not off the table. So I looked at that and I thought, yeah, a year of gold. And then I thought, for destiny, it's a year of gold. And, and I started to pray while I was sitting there. And I thought, this is a year for destiny. This is the word for the year, destiny, 2023. A year of pure gold. Say pure gold. Pure gold. And, you, and it might not be that exciting yet, but it's going to be more exciting as we get into this. This is a year of pure gold. And so when I realized that sitting there, I, I had a lot of peace really in my heart. I was like, well, that's it. I don't have to think about another thing. I don't have to pray about another thing about it. That's a done deal. And so this is the year of pure gold. So gold, um, three things about gold. Gold's a sign of purity. Um, and then I want you to think about a gold crown also, a gold crown on your head. And then I want you to remember that gold must be refined. Must be refined. Say refined. Do you notice we just... Man, that's the Holy Spirit. We just sang two songs about refining gold. Is that the Holy Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit. Through my text to the worship leader, Alicia, I want you to sing these songs because they're about my message. And so glory to God, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you about those three things. Okay, number one, pure gold. Say pure gold again. Now, pure gold is a sign of purity. And so in Haggai chapter two, verse eight, it says this. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Did you hear that? The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. That's what the Lord says. The silver is mine, the gold's mine. The Bitcoin, that could be yours. God don't care. The paper money, he ain't interested. But the gold, he said, that's mine. 
And the silver, it's mine. Well, how, mu how much of it is yours? Well, all of it. You want to know why? Because he made it. Nobody makes gold. We don't make silver. It originated with God. He created it. And he said, and by the way, it's all mine. No matter where y'all put it, no matter what you guys do with it, I want you to know it's all mine. So gold and silver are products of God. They're not a creation of man. And God designed them to be intrinsically valuable and beautiful. So why is it that gold has been valuable throughout? Isn't it crazy? It, like, like a dollar. Have you ever looked at a dollar and thought, freaks me out that this is such a big deal. It's a piece of paper, right? Well, it used to be a piece of paper that represented gold. Now it's just something that they print and pass out and take it back. And... Have you ever wondered, I don't want to get into politics this morning, but I will. Have you ever wondered why, if they can just print more money, they keep charging us more taxes? Why do they print more money if they're going to give it away? Why don't you just print some more money and not charge us taxes? Some of you don't pay taxes. You're like, I don't know. You're like, I'm 10 years old. I don't even know what you're talking about. Don't worry, you will. You'll remember this day and you'll be like, he was right. I perceive that he is a prophet. But gold, you think about gold. Why is gold valuable? Gold has always been valuable since the beginning of time. When they look at all of the histories and cultures, gold is there and it's valuable. It's worth something. You know why? Because God designed it to be worth something. It's valuable. You see it, you're like, this is valuable. It's worth something, right? You want to know why? Because it doesn't corrode and it doesn't tarnish. It doesn't leave, lose its value. Annie and I, um, well, I had been saving a bottle of wine, a couple bottles, they were gifts, and I'd been saving them for almost 10 years, maybe more than 10 years, and I, I told Annie, we were saving them for a special occasion. You ever save something for a special occasion? You're like, we're saving this for a special occasion. I was like, I'm saving, and then you know what the special occasion was? I cooked steak. That's not a special occasion. I was just like, you know what? Let's break out this $450 bottle of wine that someone gave us, and let's enjoy it and have a steak. Doesn't that sound cool? It's like, why waste? Why waste it? Why wait? Let's go. So I started opening it up and the cork disintegrated and fell down into it. And this rancid smell came up and I poured it out. The cork had fouled. The wine was wasted. It was ruined. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I told Annie, she's like, oh gosh, that's so sad. And I thought, I'm glad we didn't invite friends over. We're going to break out this 450. Never mind. We're having a soda. You know, here's some iced tea. <laughs> Not really the same, right? But we had another bottle. It was probably worth about 400 or so. And again, these are gifts. I don't spend that much money on wine. <laughs> Unless you want to, I will drink it for you. Or I'll save it until it rots. <laughs> and so I got the other bottle and I started opening it. And the same exact thing happened to the second bottle. And I was in shock. And we laughed and thought, we are so glad our friends weren't here. And, you know, there's things that we save and we save and we save and we save and they become worth less and less and less to the point that they're not worth anything. Gold isn't one of those things. I wish those people would have gave me $850 worth of gold. Come on, somebody. I'd have said, look, here's that gold they gave us. <laughs> worth more. <laughs> Let's go. Nope, they gave us wine and it rotted. Two messages in that. One's for free. It doesn't have anything to do with this message. Don't wait your whole life and waste something. Enjoy your life now. Enjoy your friends now. Enjoy your family right now. Enjoy your marriage right now. Enjoy your life right now, right? Take advantage of the great things in life. But also, that wasn't gold. It was wine. And it wasn't meant to be saved that long. And um, I just saw something funny the other day. 200, I saw this salt and it said 250 million years ago, this salt was created, blah, 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 blah. And then at the bottom, it had an expiration date. And the person said, yeah, my 250 million year old salt um, just expired. <laughs> That's funny, huh? A lot of things value will expire. The value of gold's not going to expire. It belongs to God. And uh, he designed it that way. He's into it. God's into gold. You might not think so, but the streets are paved with gold in heaven because God's into it. And the walls are like gold. They're such pure gold, the Bible says, that they look like glass. We don't even understand that because that don't make sense. That's some supernatural stuff going on. But God is into really awesome things like that. Isn't that cool? We've got to break this mindset of 
um, we can't have her enjoy nice things because God's into nice things. Heaven's nice. I don't know if you read about it. It's decked out. You know, it's not like your minimalist apartment. Like my wife and I, we have way different ideas of decorating. How many guys are in here right now that you know what I'm talking about? Some of you guys are like, yeah, we need a pool table, you know? I'm like, no, we need two things. We need dead animal heads all over the walls to show that I am capable of killing stuff. And other than that, just gray. And if you need another color, use another shade. And my wife's like, no, it needs to be nice and feel like a home. She's like, your idea of decorating looks like prison. <laughs> Whoa, take it easy. I just like simple, you know. But not God. I think he agrees with Annie. Because the streets in heaven are paved with gold. Isn't that awesome? So gold is a huge theme in scripture. You see it everywhere. The utensils in the tabernacle are made of pure gold. They're made of gold. You want to know why? Because, oh man, you got to get something good right here. Because those things that are made to be used by God are separated. I don't know if you've ever heard that word before. What's another word for that? Consecrated. These belong to God. They're made out of pure gold. And because they're made out of pure gold, you can't take the, the utensils in the tabernacle and go use them at your house to feed your kids. You can't use them to be working as garden tools. Come on, somebody. I hope somebody got the inference there. You were made for gold, made to be sanctified and be used by God. You're not supposed to be a garden tool. I can go slower. Did you get it? Some people are like, no, I still don't get it. I said, don't be a hoe. Because you belong to God and you're more important than gold. And if you think he cares about gold, the Bible says, you don't even know how much he cares about you and your soul. And you're consecrated for the holy use of God, not to be the devil digging around in the mud with your life because you were born for greater things. Amen? First Corinthians chapter three, somebody's happy because I got to the Bible. Verse 11 through 15, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus is our foundation. Verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation, that's your works and your life, right? That we're building on that foundation. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, say fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Did you get that? You apply fire to that. There's only two things that are going to make it out of that fire, the gold and the silver. If what's been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss and yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So gold represents pure works, pure motives, pure gold in our minds and our hearts will produce pure works that will survive the day of testing. That brings us to point number two. The gold crown. Say gold crown. gold crown. I want you to picture, so Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. When we're born again, we're born into his kingdom, right? And we're like him. We are co-heirs with Christ. That means we are royalty. Tell the person next to you, you're royalty. And I want you to picture a golden crown on your head. And some of you think, man, there's no way I could wear a gold crown from God on my head. And if you think that, then you don't see yourself the way God sees you. Because God sees where you're going and who you're going to be, not who you are right now. And so if we recognize the way that God sees, I want you to picture that, a gold crown on your head. If you recognize that, if you picture yourself with a gold crown from the Lord on your head, then you'll live to the calling that God has on your life. It should put pressure on you to recognize who you are and what you're called to do. There's a ring designer from a company called Knight Rider and he has a ring and a lot of times he'll use um, skulls and crowns, skulls and crowns. And people ask him, they, they say, why is that such a huge theme in what you do? And he said, well, I want people to, to see the skull and be reminded 
that you are mortal to remember that you're gonna die. And he said, and I wanna have the crown to remind you to live a life worthy of the crown. That's how I want you to think when you think of a gold crown. Not that I deserved it, because everything that we have is because of Jesus, but I wanna live a life according to the price that he paid for me. To the value, get this, to the value that he says I have. Man, you don't know where I've been. I, I know where you're going. Jesus set his mind and his heart on you, applied his blood for you because he decided that you were worth it to him. That's your value to him. And that's worth more than gold. Amen? So we read in 1 Samuel 16, 7, many of you are, are um, familiar with this verse. And we're talking about pure motives, pure heart, pure works. Verse 16, 7. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God does not judge us by our outward behavior or our acts like man does, but by the intents and desires of our hearts. Now, I don't want you to see that verse the way the world sees it. The world says, you know my heart. God knows my heart. My life, I look like a stupid idiot and an evil, wicked person, but God, you know my heart. No, 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 nope, nope, that's not Bible. That's imagination station. What I want you to think about is my good works, God doesn't see them the way that people see them. People see them and say, oh, that's good. And God says, what was your motive behind that? I'm not talking about the bad. I'm talking about the good. If you want to have a gold crown, if you want to be a person who lives a life of pure gold, then you need to have pure motives. Anything on your head in the Bible represents a mindset. The priests wore a gold plate on their head that said holiness to the Lord before they, the high priest, before he went into the Holy of Holies. Why did he wear that? Because his mindset had to be holiness before God, right? It always represents a mindset. Jesus wore the crown of thorns on his head. He's the only person in recorded history that they know of who ever wore a crown of thorns. Why did he wear a crown of thorns? Because it signified a mindset. What was the mindset? Genesis, we were cursed because of sin. What was the curse? Poverty. That the ground, we would work and it would bring forth thorns and thistles. That was the curse. Jesus came and took the crown of thorns on his head. That was taking the punishment for the poverty mindset. What's poverty? Hard work, no return or low return. Too many of us had parents who worked hard, were very um, diligent people, hardworking people who never could get ahead because of a poverty way of thinking and the curse that's on the earth. Jesus took that curse on his mind, the poverty mindset. His blood was shed. It hit the ground. The curse is broken. Amen. We can receive a kingdom mindset. Anytime you see things changing on people's heads, it's a change mindset. I want you to see yourself with a gold crown on your head, pure gold so that your thinking becomes pure unto the Lord. So that when you think about things and you do things, that you examine your motives, what is my reason? It's not good enough just to do it, that's religion. It's the right heart and attitude about why I'm doing it. The Lord is not happy with you if you stay and help clean the church and you're sweeping going, I can't believe I'm the only one here and nobody else is doing this and I'm here and man, these people, nobody is loving Jesus like me. I'm tired of this. Do you think the Lord's like, oh, I love you, my son. <laughs> but we need to be people this year that, that say, hey, I'm doing it. Why am I thinking like that? Why would I be like that? I want to thank God for my health that I could even do this. You know what? Good other people are doing something else. I'm glad I could do this. This is way less taxing than being addicted to drugs. <coughs> I remember when I got arrested one time. And in the morning they told me after breakfast, said, all right, everybody's going to start cleaning up. And if you clean up, you get a cigarette. I said, good, I don't smoke. I ain't doing nothing. And the guy said, I was 18 years old. <laughs> the guy said, pick up that mop right there and get to work. The guy next to me said, hey, when he brings a cigarette, get it and give it to me. I said, all right. So he's passing out cigarettes and I went to get one. He went to the next person. I said, hey, I want mine. He said, if I give you this cigarette, I'm going to light it and I'm going to stand there and watch you smoke it. And I literally looked at the guy next to me and said, sorry, man. <laughs> get, it. get the cigarette. It ain't going to happen, you know. 
You could be mopping the floor in church. You could be mopping the floor in jail. Well, I ain't never been to jail. Well, you know what? You and your sucky attitude could stay religious. Or you could live according to the crown that the Lord sees that you could wear on your head and say, man, I want pure motives. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to change my mind and line my mind up with what I'm doing. Oh, I take my kids, man. I'm tired. I got so many things to do. Change your mind. Man, I'm going to give to the Lord. It's offering time. I'm going to give. Oh, man, I'm going to give my money. I'm broke and blah, blah, blah. What's the Bible say? God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. I love all of them. I don't care. If you want to give, give with a bad attitude. It pays the bills just the same. Come on, somebody. You got to pay the APS bill at the church one way or the other, and the APS doesn't say, hey, were these people happy? I'm like, I don't know, man, but keep the lights on. Like, that don't happen. I don't care. But if you want pure motives, it's not about whether you do it. It's about your heart. It's about, man, I want to engage my heart and have a right heart, a right attitude, a right motive. Amen? I saw a guy one time. We were in, going to Promise Keepers in L.A. We had a van full of these Christian guys going to Promise Keepers. Some of you probably remember Promise Keepers. And I saw this guy on the side of the corner. He had a sign and said, I need some food. And I said, hey, what's up? We stopped in the van, you know, at the light. And I said, what's up? He said, I'm hungry. And I said, we're going, I don't remember, I think it was McDonald's. I can't remember if it was McDonald's or Carl's Jr. I don't remember. But I said, we're going right there. If you want something to eat, go there and I'll buy you some lunch. And I thought, he ain't going to come. He just wants money. That dude started running. <laughs> he was running and we're in traffic. So he got there before us. And I thought, well, that dude's hungry, you know? So we got up to the door and he was holding the door open for me and my friends. He said, are you really going to buy me lunch? I said, of course, I'm going to buy you lunch. Come on. So we got in line and I said, uh, what do you want? He said, well, what are you going to get? Because he was trying to be polite, you know? And I was like, I was thinking, man, this dude could be my brother. He could be my dad. He could be one of my friends. I hope somebody would buy them lunch. And I said, well, you can have whatever you want. It doesn't matter. He said, well, I'm just going to have what you have. So I ordered way more than I would normally order just so he could have enough food. And I ate it. <laughs> it's like, you know what you need? Extra. And uh, I didn't need extra, but I ate it because starving kids in Africa. And, uh, so we went to go get our food and sit down, and he went and sat by himself. And I said, what are you doing? He says, eating the food. I said, do you want to eat with us? He said, can I? I said, yeah, if you want to. And he came over and was all happy and joined us. And we had food, and we told him, yeah, we're going to this Christian conference, and that's why I bought you the food, just, you know, because Jesus loves you, man. He's like, thank you so much. He was so happy. And you know what? Check this out, guys. And I don't have a reward in heaven now because I told you about it. Now you're like, you're so nice, and I have received my reward, so. But I need to share that with you for a reason. That can never be taken away. I didn't do it for any other reason. I would have done it if I was by myself. I didn't do it for any, I did it because there was a hungry guy right there and I wanted to buy him food. Do that, do that. Am I saying you should all take people and feed them? I don't know, maybe. I'm saying whatever you do in your life, do it with a right heart and pure motives just to bless that person. Look, sometimes you pray with somebody to give their life to Jesus and you never see them again. Don't think, man, that was a waste of time. You don't know. You did it with a right heart and a right motive. Pray for that person, that God's grace would cover them, that something would happen to take care of them, right? Maybe you were taking care of someone that became a Christian and you were giving your life and training them and discipling them and they left and never talked to you again. You're like, that was a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. We do it as unto the Lord. We're doing it for Jesus and because we love people, not that they owe us something or we're trying to get something back. Does that make sense? Do everything that you do with a pure heart and a pure motive, and you'll be blessed. How many of you are already thinking, man, I'll probably be happier if I think like that? It's weird. It's almost like the Lord knows how we are. Why am I miserable? Stop thinking about yourself. Did you know it's impossible to be depressed if you uh, stop thinking about yourself? Proverbs 16, 2, all the ways of man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Proverbs 17, 3, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. Isn't that good? You like it? You don't like it? We gotta change our minds. I remember when I was um, just starting in ministry and I was at Community Christian Church and leading the youth there. My friend Chad was there and... Uh, we both were young preachers, you know, and I remember the pastor said, Chad, you're going to preach in two weeks. 
You know, and I got upset inside, not on the outside, right? Because I'm a Christian. But uh, on the inside, I was like, man, I wonder why I didn't get to preach, you know? Why well, should be able to preach? Why chat? And, but even, I, I wasn't taught about renewing the mind at that time or anything. But even then, I realized, wow, that's a terrible attitude. Why would I think that? Like, something's wrong with me. And so I was trying to work it out. I did work it out, praise the Lord. I was trying to work it out, but in the process, I decided until I figure it out, I'm Chad's biggest cheerleader. I helped him get ready for his message. I encouraged him before he preached. I sat in the front row and shouted, amen, come on, tell him, Chad. And I was the only one in that church didn't say anything. So it was probably a little weird. Chad was happy and I was happy and he was bringing it. You know what I celebrated with him? God was using him in his gift. And I realized that I had some things that I had to work out because you know what? I didn't want to just do the right thing on the outside. I wanted to get this right. I'm like, that's not right. Too many times as Christians, we forget about that, that it's the motives, not what people see. That's religion. Let's be better for God. Let's be like, have that mindset of pure gold before the Lord that I want my motive to be right for loving you. I want my motive to be right for everything that I do and not what anybody sees. I don't care if everybody agrees with you. I want the Holy Spirit to say, yeah, I agreed with you. That was the right motive. And you know what? If we get our minds right and our hearts right, then our actions will be right. I think sometimes we're doing it wrong. We're trying to do the right actions and not renew our mind and that's religion. Nobody, look, nobody wants to be religious, right? Right? Okay, I'm making sure I'm talking to the right people. Some people are like, yeah, I want to be religious. Like, well, carry on with your dumb self. <laughs> but I want to have the right motive for what I do. Amen? All right, point number three. Last one. Refiner's fire. Say refiner's fire. So the thing about gold is that gold must be refined. It's not just good the way it is. You ever hear that saying? God... Um, you know, the Lord says, come just as you are. And he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. Yeah. I'm gonna say that again. When you come to church and you give your life to Jesus, the Lord loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. Why would that be? Because when they find gold, it's never in a pure state. It's always alloyed with other metals and minerals and things that are not Somebody's got to get this that are not as valuable. Man, this is good. But man, with some refining, it could be incredibly better. Not just, it could be incredibly much more valuable if it was refined. You are more valuable than you have ever known. The Lord knows and he believes in you. He's trying to refine you to reflect and show what he has put inside of you. There is glory inside of you that came from God. But it's never found in its pure, in its natural state. Natural, human, low level. The glory is never found in natural state. It has to be refined. Say, I have to be refined. And how do they refine gold? There's all kinds of different ways. Nowadays they use acid and all these chemicals and stuff. But the oldest way, and the way that they still do it today, is with fire. Um, they refine gold and involves the application of heat. It's the oldest method of obtaining pure gold. Gold scraps are placed in a crucible, say crucible, a crucible is a container that can withstand very high temperatures. The crucible is then placed in a furnace, which is heated up to almost 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The gold melts at such a high temperature. It's then transferred to another container, leaving the impurities and other substances floating at the surface. So the crucible is a material, usually metal, that melts at a higher temperature. So it can withstand the fire so that the gold can be melted and separated from the impurities. You have to think about how hot that is, 2,000 degrees, hard to imagine um, the amount of heat that that is. So you have to think about a crucible. It can withstand heat that's melting gold and separating it from other um, alloys and, and other minerals. 
And I want you to picture that process, going into the fire, melting, separating. Then I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 9 to you. I really want to focus on verse 7, but this, the context of this is so good. Listen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into, got to get this, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Did you get that? How many people know that is not like the wine that I had been saving? It's more valuable than gold. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. Now watch this. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Somebody say amen. amen. Why have these trials come? These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For, watch this, you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We are actively now receiving the end result. Somebody's got to get that. We are saved because of the blood of Jesus. When we gave our life to the Lord, we started experiencing our salvation now that is the result, the end. The Lord's like, I'm going to give it to you now. How good is that? That's the result of our faith. Why do these trials come? To refine us and to reveal our faith to show that you are authentic, to prove you, to test you. The trials of life are like the crucible and your faith is even more valuable than gold. Proverbs 17, three, in the same way that gold and silver are refined by fire, the Lord purifies your heart by the tests and trials of life. Don't worry, 2023 is not a year of tests and trials. It's not the year of the crucible. <laughs> Don't panic. It's the year of pure gold. The precious metal is very rarely found un unalloyed with other substances. And the work of the refiner is to free it from these substances. Why do we go through the trials? To free you from the corruption from the impurities. Why? Why do they refine gold? Because when they're finished and they separate it, the value is so much more. Who you are is more valuable than you can ever imagine. The trials and tests of life God allows and some has designed to bring out your faith and your value to separate you from the things that are hiding who you are. How many people, when you see gold, you're like, that's shiny. Why is it that we see it and we want it? Isn't it a weird thing? I found gold in an airport in Singapore. I saw this guy, his name's Paul Pogmore. And I had done missions with Paul in different places around the world, and Russia was one of them. And, and I saw him in the airport, and I said, Paul, what's happening? And I went to hug him, and he kind of was like blocking me from hugging him. I'm like, receive my love, brother. I was like, whoa, what's up? And he said, don't you remember the last time we saw each other, we were fighting. I was like, no, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> I must have won. <laughs> I didn't remember. He's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, but that doesn't matter. Who cares? How are you, man? How's your family? How's your mission? He's like, I don't want to talk to you. And I was like, wow, that's a small man in a small life. Yeah. Well, God bless you, Paul. And then God showed me right after that that he loved me way more than Paul. Because <laughs> I turned around and as I was walking away, I found a gold ring. And the Lord's like, see, Paul didn't find a gold ring. I'm just joking. But I, but I picked up this gold ring. I was like, whoa, this is a wedding ring. And it looked 
kind of weird. It was pretty heavy. And I went and started asking all the people, hey, did you drop a wedding ring? Did anybody drop a wedding band? And I was trying to find out. Anybody could have said, yeah, it's mine. I would have gave it to them, right? Nobody, nobody, nobody. I was like, glory. Put it in my pocket. And I took it home. One day I went to a guy who, who buys gold in Scottsdale. And I said, hey, um, I have this ring. And he said, okay. And he looked at it and he started weighing it. And he said, hey, where'd you get this? I said, why? And he said, this is not common. I said, why? And he said, this is uh, 22 karat gold. I said, okay. He said, they don't really, they don't, we don't make rings 22 karat gold because it's too soft. Won't hold its shape. He said, where did you find this? And I said, well, I got it in Singapore. He said, yeah, this is probably from India because they'll make rings with a higher gold content because 24 karat gold is pure gold, right? So 22 karat gold, super soft. And so most rings would be 18 karat gold or 14 karat gold, really. Um, and, and they're just too malleable, right? So they mix them with other things to hold their shape. And so he's like, yeah. He said, well, I didn't have to tell you that. I could have paid you less, but it's actually more gold content I'm going to give you. More is more valuable because it's more pure. Let me say that one more time. It was more valuable because it was more pure. Come on, guys. Let's, let's be more, not more valuable to God. He loves us. He already gave the blood of his son. That's our value to him. But to each other, and to the people on the earth, we will have more valuable, we'll be more valuable and have more value the more pure we are and separated from those things that will corrupt us. Amen? So there's no good ending to the Paul Pogmore story. He probably doesn't like me and I still love him. I don't care. I don't even know what he's mad about. Um, so the crucible, hold on, let me see what time it is. Ah, plenty of time. The crucible is a container of metal or refract refractory material employed for heating substances to high temperatures. And then another definition is a severe searching test or trial. What does crucible mean? It's a severe test or trial or an extremely challenging experience. The figurative sense of a crucible is based on the literal meaning of the word, a heat resistant container used to melt metals. Crucible in the literal sense is used in the context of metallurgy, the science of working with and refining metals. The word is perhaps best known for its use in the title of a 1953 play, The Crucible, by Arthur Miller. But crucible is usually applied to a situation, check this out, that tests a person's character and perhaps changes them forever. Did you hear that? That, that tests a person's character and perhaps changes them forever. The association of extreme heat with extremely challenging experiences can be found in many other expressions such as trial by fire. The purpose of the refining fire is not to destroy, but to save, to purify, to increase the value. So again, I'm not talking about this year as the year of the crucible. What I'm talking about is how many people feel like you have, now I want you to think about it for a second. How many people think that you have been through a crucible in your life that was an extreme test of your character and it changed you forever? How many people believe that you've been through something like that? How many people believe that you probably got a couple of those lined up before you <laughs> get off this rock? <laughs> yeah, that's a real thing. But it's in the crucible that we're refined, purified that our value is increased, that our shine is shown. And so when I was thinking about this word, this is what I, I started thinking about. I need to revisit some of the crucible moments in my past. Why? Because I think I may have missed the lessons in some of them. Have you ever been through something with God and you have this question, you're like, why? <laughs> Has anybody ever yelled that at God? Has anybody ever yelled it in your head at God every day driving down the street? Has anybody ever said to the Lord, are you freaking kidding me right now? Like, and you know those things that God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not in the Bible. That's actually talking about sin and temptation. God will absolutely give you more than you can handle because he wants you to depend on him. You know, God tells the gold, don't worry, I won't give you more than you can handle. I'm going to heat you up until you melt. Everything that's been a part of you comes out of you. And I'm going to make you into something else. That sounds like more than I can handle. <laughs> not, the gold's not like, good, the crucible again. <laughs> so I, I went to this, 
a guy that used to be here, he had a little conference at the Civic Center, and he asked me to go. Matt went with me, and he said, hey, do you want to come? My pastor's coming from out of town. And he's a famous preacher. I hadn't heard of him, but I guess in a circle he was well-known and stuff. And I was like, yeah, let's go. So I went, just jeans and T-shirt, me and Matt, sat in the back and just enjoyed it. The guy didn't know I was a pastor. He didn't know me from anybody. And he said, hey, anybody that's going through a hard time in your life, why don't you come up here to the front? And I was like, well, I'm here. I mean, this is why I'm here. I'm going to go get prayed for, right? And I walked up there, and he's praying for people, and he's prophesying over people. And he says, uh, what's your name? And I said, Rich. And he goes, oh, man, God gave me a word for you. I was like, okay. He said, man, you're going through hard trials right now. You're in the dark. And I was like, you know how you do that? You look at your friend like, did you tell him about me? And he said, but in this trial, I want you to stop running, trying to get through it as quick as you can. I want you to slow down and put your hands out. And I want you to feel the walls on each side of this chasm because there's jewels in this trial. You're going in rich and you're coming out richer. And I think when I think about the crucible, I think there's too many times that I was in the crucible and I was yelling, why God? Instead of what for? What are you trying to show me? How can I put my faith more in you and trust you in this trial so I don't come out the same like that song we were singing? How can I look at this and see what are you trying to take out of me and what are you trying to purify? What are you trying to, how, how are you refining me in this? Because guys, the worst thing is we have gone through those trials. Let's not waste those trials. Maybe God did some stuff in us and we didn't recognize it. Maybe we could go back and look at 2022 and see some very difficult moments and reflect on those things and say, man, I'm coming out pure gold. I'm coming out pure gold. This happened in my life. God's using that. I'm coming out as gold. What could I have learned? I'm going to be who God's called me to be. He's taken me through the fire so that I could be of more value to the people around me. So that I could be, I'm going to live my life worthy of the crown that the Lord sees on my head. I want my thoughts to be pure. I want my motives to be pure. I want my heart to be pure before the Lord in everything that I do this year. Is that good? Yeah. Let's make this a year of recognizing those crucible moments and being who God's called us to be. Man, I don't know what could produce holiness in a person more than having pure motives before the Lord. God, I'm praying right now, not because I'm religious, but because I need you. God, I'm praying right now because I don't feel like it. You ever done that? I've done it. Prayers work. Many times I go to prayer and I'm like, I don't want to do this. And I start off with, Lord, you know, I don't want to do this. And this is why I'm doing it because obviously I have a problem. <laughs> and then once you've been there a minute, I'm so glad I did this, right? Let's have pure motives. Let's be honest with the Lord in worship. Lord, I'm worshiping right now, not because I'm worthy, but because you're worthy. Lord, I'm worshiping right now, not because everything's great, but because you're great. Lord, I'm worshiping right now, not because I'm awesome, but because I need this. Touch my life. Light me on fire. Purify me during worship. Purify me as I read the word. Amen? Come on, so this is going to be a great year, guys. 1 Peter 1, 7, pure gold put in the fire comes out proved pure. Get this, genuine faith put through this summer, suffering comes out proved genuine. You are here. You did not quit. You didn't give up. Your faith is real. I'm gonna say that again. You didn't quit when you could have. You didn't quit when you wanted to at some time in your life. You kept serving Jesus. You might say, well, I did quit. Well, you're here today. Come on, somebody. The righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up every single time. Keep getting up. Don't quit. Prove that your faith is real. Prove that the grace of God on your life is real by getting up every day and serving him. Get up and say, Lord, I'm a mess today. If that's the case, say, I'm a mess. I don't even know what's going on with me, but I'm still gonna worship you. I'm still gonna praise you and I'm gonna do my best. I might not have a lot to offer, but what I have to offer, I'm gonna give it to you. Come on, somebody. I'm gonna go to church, not because I want to. I'm gonna go to church because I said I would. 
You're like, what? Wait a minute. Isn't that religion? No, man, that's commanding your body to worship God. That's your spirit taking control. Amen. We're all going to do this in our life. Guess what? It doesn't matter if it's peaks or valleys. Let's worship and praise God. Let's set that in our heart. When my heart and my mind is not lined up with the word of God, I'm going to renew it. I'm going to renew it. Amen. Now I'm going to read you just a couple more things and then we're, we're done. God does not punish us willingly. He would rather spare us from the fires of affliction. Do you believe that? He doesn't want to punish us. He didn't want to punish his son, but he had to, to rescue us. And he didn't allow one thing to happen to Jesus that didn't have to happen. There was no extra beating, no, every single thing he went through, the father allowed it because it had to happen. How many of you know he loves you? He loved you enough to give Jesus for you. Everything that we go through has to happen. Everything that we go through has to happen. God is refining you. Some of it is just evil in the world, but God's gonna allow that even to work together for good. Come on. He's gonna work on your faith and he's gonna prove that you're real. God um, would rather spare us from the fires of affliction, but he has no other means to free us from the impurity of sin than the fire. And Job Maybe you haven't read the book of Job, but you may have heard some of the stories of Job. This is, he was, went through the most trials you could imagine. And he said this, Job said this about God. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And then we're getting ready to stand. I want you to think about this. I'm not going to talk about this morning. I'm just going to give it to you. So I think about the crown. Picture the crown, a gold crown on your head. From the Lord, it's representing pure thoughts, pure motives, pure intention, pure heart, pure thinking. And there's only one time in the Bible that I've seen that there's fire on people's heads. And that's Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. And the Bible says tongues of fire sat on each of them. You know what? We need the fire of the presence of the Holy Spirit to refine our thinking, our motives, our intention, our faith. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit as we read the word and as we worship burn in our minds and in our hearts to refine us so that we would be who God's called us to be. Amen? 2023, pure gold. That's for you and for your family. Let's teach our kids that too. Pure motives, pure heart, pure worship. Come on, let's be standing together. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning and for every person who's here. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to submit ourselves and our minds and our hearts to you, to the Holy Spirit for refining, that we would also take time in these next weeks and consider the crucible moments in, in this last year and even in years in our life and start to see the value in what you were doing in those moments in our lives. Help us, Lord, not to focus on the heat. Help us to focus on your glory and on your plan and that we trust you. We trust you, Jesus. We put our, our lives into your hands. We trust you. Lord, refine us. Make us who you've called us to be. Let the gold that you created in us shine in the name of Jesus. Come on, let your faith shine in your life. Let it shine in your marriage and in your home. Let it shine at work. Let it shine when you're around people in the community. Just let that love and the glory of God in your life shine around others. Lord, we love you so much. Come on, if you've been through some hard things, you've been in crucible moments, just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, raise your hand right now. Raise your hand. I want you to receive this right now. Get ready. Pure gold. That's what's coming out. Pure gold. It wasn't for nothing. It wasn't for nothing. It wasn't for nothing. It wasn't for nothing. Come on, it wasn't for nothing. You didn't go through the things you went through. It wasn't for nothing. It was for something. It's because God saw something in you of value. He's increasing your value. He's purifying you. 
He's making you greater. Come on, you didn't go through those things for nothing. It wasn't for nothing, it was for something. And I speak right now that your faith is gonna come out tried and proven and genuine and more valuable than pure gold in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, somebody praise the Lord. Remember, take that word, mix it with faith. Take that word, mix it with faith. When you read the Bible, pray, talk to the Lord, have him show you stuff, mix it with faith, amen? And let's work that word into our lives so that we have pure motives, pure hearts, pure worship. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, we wanna give you a chance to do that. The Bible says everyone has sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, which means if you die without giving your life to Jesus, you'll be separated from him from all eternity in a place called hell. And I know when people hear that, they think, well, why would a loving God want to send me to hell? And I want you to know he doesn't want to send anyone to hell. That's why he sent his son, Jesus. Jesus came to pay our price so we could be rescued. He was born of a virgin. He lived on this planet. He never sinned. He's perfect. He's the only one that could pay the price for our sins. And the Bible says that God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for our sins. So everything Jesus went through is what we deserved because of our own sin. So he gave himself and they took him, stripped him of his clothes, strapped him to a post. They beat him with a Roman whip, ripped his flesh from his body. He's the son of God. He could have made it stop, but he endured it for you and for me. And Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes, referring to that beating, we are healed. After that, they put the cross on his back. He carried it to Calvary. When he got there, they stretched him out. They put nails in his hands and his feet, and they raised him up. Remember, everything that he went through is what we deserved. He didn't deserve any of it, but he loved us so much, he did it in our place. He took the nails in his hands and his feet, they raised him up, and he hung there for six hours, paying for all of our sins, everything that we've ever done. And before he died, he said, it is finished. What does that mean? It means the price is paid. He died, they took him down from the cross, they put him in a tomb, and when they went there on the third day, he wasn't there, he was raised from the dead. And Romans 10, nine and 10 says, if you believe that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, you will be saved. What does it mean to be saved? It means when you die, you're not going to hell, you're going to heaven. But it also means that Jesus will forgive you for your sins. He'll come and live inside of you today and your guilt and shame can be taken away. And everything we talked about today, that can be your life, that could be yours. So if you've never given your life to Jesus before and you're here this morning and you wanna do that, you want me to pray for you, just go ahead and raise your hand right where you're at and I'll pray for you to give your life to Jesus. Anybody today? You've never given your life to the Lord, but you want to today. Come on, don't be afraid. If there's anybody here and you need to get right with Jesus, this is your time. This is for you. This is the most important time. Is there anybody here that maybe you used to go to church or you used to serve the Lord? Maybe you went when you were younger and you stopped going. You're not serving him now. I'm not saying you had a bad week or you said a bad word. You want to get closer to the Lord. I'm saying you're just been away from him and you're here today and you wanna start living for him again, just rededicate your life and live for him. He's not mad at you, he's not angry with you, he's watching and waiting for you to come home. So anybody here today, you need to rededicate your life. I'll pray for you, raise your hand if you need to rededicate your life this morning. Nobody? I don't hardly believe it's nobody. I'm gonna do a reverse altar call right now. I'm gonna tell everybody who's saved, come to the altar, and if you're still staying in your seat, come back there and lay hands on you, cast demons out of you. I'm not gonna do that. If you didn't raise your hand to give your life to the Lord or rededicate, we'll have some leaders up here in the front. Please don't leave without somebody praying for you. That's our heart. We, we just want you to know the Lord and we want you to be right with the Lord. Or if you're, you have any sickness or anything you want prayer, there'll be some people up here. Somebody raising their hand? Oh, you raise your hand? Great. Awesome. Really good. That's awesome. Really good. I'll pray for you in just a second. Um, 
But if you need somebody to pray with you, come up here. We have leaders here every, every, uh, after every service to pray for you so you can get right with the Lord. And bring somebody. Bring somebody. They need to hear how much Jesus loves them and what he has for them so they can be saved. Amen? All right, come on, give her his hand. If you would, just come up here. I want to pray for you real quick. Does she want to come up? You want me to come back there? I just want to lead you in a prayer. It's okay, come on. Come on, give her a hand, guys. Hi, I just want to pray for you. Okay, repeat after me. Oh, come on. Awesome. I'm just going to lead you guys in a prayer right now. Just repeat after me, okay? You can translate for it if you want to. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I love you. I'm going to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, I just pray right now for these two women of God that you would touch them and bless them and pour out your spirit on them. If they have any sickness in their body, we speak healing in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for your word that says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. And we receive that in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your word that says, if any man is in Christ, they're a new creation, that old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. And we speak that this is not just a new year, but you are new in Christ. And this is a new day and a new new season in your life and we speak blessing and that you would see yourselves as daughters of the most high God. We thank you, Lord, for your grace in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Now I want you to picture somebody that you love, family member, friend, somebody you work with standing right there praying that receiving salvation and their lives being changed. Amen. And uh, it's the most important thing. What a great way to start the year. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Bless every person as we go out. Let us be a blessing to everybody that we come in contact with. We love you and we thank you in Jesus name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Go in victory.